Hello. Um, Krakow is awesome. And I'm going to speak about an open Erlang platform called Voxes. Uh, the main goal of which is remove state from your DevOps. And why is that so? Because DevOps is about side effects. You have too many resources within your app, too many files, too many configuration files that disrupt, disrupt your productivity, mainly because uh, this is the thing that are handled by some other people in your team. And ops is mainly the place where stuff goes ro wrong and breaks, no matter how smart your program is, just because your OS is not configured properly by someone. And we're trying to get rid of that. Uh, having a cloud environment in mind. Why cloud is because you don't always have to pay for having and exploiting a machine in your environment or having something in your rack. You might have zero machines tonight and you have, may have a hundred uh, tomorrow depending on your workload and the number of your clients. And we are also uh, an early adopters of Erlang and Zen which is a pretty cool rockstar but a statue which I'm gonna dive into later. And we are adopting Docker, which is a hipster technology which does everything for containers. Um, but why Voxes? There are too many platforms already. There are Heroku, there are OpenShift, uh, there are cl this Cloud Foundry, and they all try to do something that does some thing about deploying stuff into the cloud and making it magically work. But first of all, we're trying to concentrate on Erlang as uh, not every pass tries to concentrate their forces on working with Erlang hygiene and making Erlang like operations uh, that look very much like the way you write programs in Erlang. And there's no need to copy existing ones, so Voxes is more of like a research that makes our lives, uh, the eyes of me and my team, uh, easier when we go to Erlang. And when it comes down to the platform, we have to hack on the code, and I think no platform devotes much time to this. They only care about deploying and scaling, and I care about prototyping as fast as I can, and I care about deploying as many times as I care during the day, because I want to see other people make other people see the results of my work. So I want to make like it's the future, like it was in the past, in 1980s, where the result of your work was a single binary that you can give out on a diskette, a floppy disk, and they could just run one binary and that's okay. And now you have Pythons, Rubies, and Javas where you have to take care of the virtual machine of resources, images, and connections to databases. And it's a lot harder now. So I try to call it the first along platform done right because it's right because it doesn't have much features, which I'm going to explain later. And when I speak about hacking, I mean... Um, your environment where you're working and you write code in shouldn't be far different from the, your production environment. Pretty much because most of you develop on their MacBooks or Linux or Windows boxes and they deploy in the cloud which has different operating system and when it comes down to interoperability of your system with your application, you have all kinds of integration problems that you can discover early. And you want to hack reproducibly. It means that if you create an app and it has too many dependencies because it's a quick prototype, like it uses Node.js for CSS minifying, God save us from it, and um, it uses Python for some scripts just because Python has too many libraries for different stuff, and you can't just uh, give it away without writing a huge readme explaining how to, to do it on different systems and locking down to versions of dependencies of your apps. And we actually had a case in our experiences when this were, where not having such a platform showed us in a bad light. Uh, we have um, an app called Skyline which uses N2O, the framework for um, WebSocket framework for Erlang and the Skyline is like 
a WebShop-like application, and it has a nice library in it that allows you to authenticate with OAuth, with Facebook, uh, GitHub, and some popular social websites. And this app was in interest to Joe Armstrong, who's the creator of Elang, and he get, got our application. He downloaded it to his MacBook, and he couldn't compile it because the app required Node.js to do JavaScript processing. And we spent like two days explaining to how to get Node.js up and running his machine. Instead, we could just give, give him a binary or link and say that just type this one command and you will have the separate up, up and running. And this would be much easier. Um, when you hack, it means you don't have to make any frictions like you would do in P uh, like you don't do in PHP, for example. A PHP is basically a processor for CGI scripts where you, some interpreter reads a file, runs a script, and that's it. And in Erlang, you have to take care about running virtual machine, you have to recompile modules, you have to run tests manually, and that's annoying. And people say that this, this is the task of an IDE, and an IDE is usually separate from a deployment platform, and this is not a good thing because uh, there are still discrepancies in your environments which you have to take care of manually. And good hacking means no more excuses that this particular feature works in your machine and on your machine only. Um, so, for example, if you have a Mac and you deploy it to Linux, you always get into problems when you write a port app and it uses KQ and your Linux doesn't have KQ and you get to EPOL, you have to rewrite your app and then you make mistakes and you waste time. For example, if you write a uh, file system ob ob observing app, uh, you have a problem of having different interfaces. For example, macOS has a fast events and Linux has identify. And you, as you hack on macOS, you have to have some other guy writing your app. Or, for example, you try to deploy from one Linux to another and you're sending the West, which runs in production was R14, which is like a decade old. <laughs> and you have to port your error encode to run it on R14 if your management or CTOs don't allow you to upgrade. Or you compile ports on one Linux machine or on a Mac and then just transfer it and it doesn't work. but Everyone who evangelizes Erlang tells you that the beam like works everywhere, you write code and then redeploy it and everything's fine. But it's not true because uh, your app almost often depends on every a lot of C code that you can just copy from one machine to another with the run. And then, once you finish hacking, you have to deploy. And if you have more than one command to deploy, you're busted. If no one will waste time to figure out how to deploy your app if he's not a ops geek. Or this is probably the reason why languages like Go is popular. When you compile a Go app, you have one binary that has all libraries in it, and you can even cross-compile on a Mac a binary that will work on, on Linux. And this fact is very much exploited by guys who write Docker, and they have 10,000 likes in their GitHub repo, and they have write a bazillion of money for that. Well, however, for some reason, Haskell is always also delivering a static binary, but it's not so popular maybe because it doesn't cross-compile, or maybe for some other reason, I guess, because the language is hard. So, probably some of you know the comics, and it says, so how do I query this database? And the other response is, it's not a database, it's a key value store. Okay, so how do I query it? Well, you write a distributed MapReduce function Erlang. Did you just tell me to go fuck myself? I believe I did, Bob. So, same story in DevOps. Basically, how do I run this app? Well, you have to write, get this thing and then do something with it. So when you deploy, you don't have to have any moving parts, like an operating system, a runtime, libraries, and some state that's also bound to your app, which you don't take care of directly. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you have to do when you redeploy your app. For example, um, 
you have to deploy these 10 files because they don't have the same configuration format. And you always forget to leave this as no to ops or you don't correctly fill your deploy scripts and it all breaks. How many of you have seen this error? When you were running a ring in production? Yeah, I see hands and they know what this means. And you don't want to see this anymore, I guess. Um, uh, so in Linux, as well, when you use an operating system, you have a bunch of features that you don't need to use, but they don't need to use, but they exist despite of you knowing about them. For example, a C Linux that it forces some uh, policies on you being not being able to use the machine properly, and everyone who just sees Linux machine, the first thing he does, he goes and uh, deletes C Linux or just disables it. And you don't need any users, you just run your app under two users like root and some unprivileged user, you don't need access control lists, you probably don't need file systems because you have cloud storage and like React and React CS and it doesn't actually need a file system because it's, it is a wrapper on its own file system called DevilDB basically. And it has networking stack which you don't need to care about because uh, it just slows you down and you have package managers and I guess no one of you well, little of you probably even care to deploy their apps using common package manager. They just copy the files and make sure they run. And when you use package managers, you have just problems like half deploys. Is when half of the, your app has installed and there was an error in your script, and um, and then you have to roll back because your deploy is is not completely full. And there is no rollback procedure because you haven't taken care of it because no one takes care of rollbacks because the newer software is always better. And it's always slow. And with Linux you have these hacks when you uh, have to implement zero copy stuff that doesn't interact with the kernel too much to save yourself from speed and you use features like NetBap, NetMap, Direct, block device access, for virtualization drivers, use hacks like Chief and Puppet to help you manage state. So basically all you do is like your operating system is a variable and you do a lot of operations to change it properly. And this is, doesn't look pretty compelling to you as a software developer. Um, and you want to scale. So a for some reason, when you work on an application, scaling is something that is done by the people who don't write the code. It's all pretty often is done by people who just run stuff. And when they think of scaling, it means that you just spawn more instances of this application, more nodes, which doesn't always work. But anyway, people do that and just pray that nothing breaks. And then tune the load balancer, which isn't a concern of the developer, but of an operation guy. And when scaling, you can just rely on third-party software because you don't know how it works. It means that when you work with any other app and use it in your project, you transitively make it a project of your own because you have to know all its bugs and maintain it with your code base. Otherwise, it will cause you downtime or bugs or errors. Otherwise, in any case, it's like losing money. So um, it's pretty cool to use lib libraries like Raya Core that handle a lot of fault tolerance and scaling problems for you. Uh, uh, consensus algorithms like Craft that are not common in operating system and their scaling solutions. And you wanted to have a, like a library that does cloud operations for you in your code, which correlates co co with the DevOps manifesto of that the code is your configuration. And Vox is a project that tries to have an OTP-like library of supervision trees for nodes, which is, which is a more higher level abstraction than just processes. So, and when you deploy to cloud, you want to be aware of your topology. When you just spin up to Ubuntu instances, you don't know if they run on the same box or in two boxes. And you may not want to have these two instances write to the same disk because uh, if that disk fails, your application thinks that there are two copies of the data, but actually there was one and you're, you lose data. And you want hot, hot migration 
is if you want to sp spin up a new instance uh, of your app, you want to run the old version for a while until everything that settles. And uh, clouds are currently too expensive for that because you have to spend like 10 minutes spinning up a new Ubuntu node and waiting for it to provision. And then you have to configure it. And this is not cheap at all. And you want to have instant bursting. And that's where Elon and Zen shines. For those who don't know Elon and Zen, it's a pretty wow technology. Uh, it it doesn't need an operating system. It's a bare virtual machine in its entirety. It doesn't do any SMP at all because basically S SMP takes care of you taking all over the processors on your machine. But in the cloud, the data center is your machine. You don't know how many machines are you running on. And it's so cool that it boots in 30 milliseconds where half of this time is the overhead of the hypervisor. It's very fast. It beats Beam in some benchmarks. And it's pretty. it means it's pretty elastic that uh, if you can boot a lot of machines in a, in a second, you can scale pr pretty damn fast comparing to operating system-based solutions that require a lot of overhead. And this reminds of 30 milliseconds is only 30, 10 times slower than spinning up a process on a Mac. So one, it takes one millisecond to run to start an LS process on my Mac machine, as seen on this measurement. And for then you can do cool stuff like running a thousand nodes and passing seven million, well, one message through seven million processes in five minutes. This demo was given in Kiev by the guys who work on Elong and Zen. And a OS la Open system less instance helps you solve some problems like too many levels of indirection or too many levels of abstraction that you have to care about. Like when you have a database like an application, it usually has a query cache and it has its own data structure that manages the disk layout. And then it goes through language VM and then it jumps into the kernel where there another cache, another file system like data structure that manages disk layout, and then there's a block cache that handles uh, the disk subsystem, which accesses blocks on your disk. And when you see resources, uh, well, researches in, uh, in Twitter, on the network, on Hacker News, wherever, you see that people try to write applications that try to utilize the resources they work on to their maximum. For example, people, try to optimize their hash tables to fit into SSD pages. And this is something that you handle in your application and some people work on the OS. And when there's disparity, you lose performance. So this stuff belongs to an OS kernel in the bottom and you can just remove it. And that's what basically Ling or Lang and Zen is. Its virtual machine is called Ling. You, it's not closed source. And um, it has a free build service, so you can get binaries and run on Amazon or your own Zen hypervisor. Um, I personally don't have direct access to its code, but I live in the same city as its creator, so we all often chat, and I kind of can influence sometimes their their feature decisions. Hope oh. and Ling is mostly R16. It's actively developed. If you use it and find a bug, just fire it there. It's pretty cool as it doesn't have any traditional traditional like solutions for common problems that you encounter. For example, it has it looks a lot like exokernel and implement a 9p protocol from Plan 9 for external file systems. Uh, you can access regular file systems and have file system like API. Um, it has its own networking stack. Uh, it ha uses LWAP, it doesn't have a normal file system at all for persistence, it uses GUFS, which is pretty like a hack that allows you to allocate disks in four megabyte blocks, which is more than enough for your own level DB installation or Hanoi DB or whatever. It doesn't have NIFS at all because NIFS is pretty much a problem for scheduling because you can't just 
mm, properly count reductions if you have NIFs, and it causes scheduler problems if there are non, none of them. It means that some Merlin features don't work yet, like ASN1 it means NSSL doesn't work right now, but I work, was working it yesterday during talks, <laughs> and um, it doesn't have net kernel because net kernel basically tries to Erlang distribution protocol tries to connect everything to everyone, and you probably don't want to have that in cloud because it gives you too much overhead. It doesn't have Erlang tracing. Well, that's bad, but it has its own link tracing, which isn't as flexible as Beams right now. It has its own profiler, and it has its own debugging version that you can attach GDB to and try to reverse engineer if you need to. Well, it doesn't have much of documentation, uh, like. These um, three features were explicitly asked by me and they were implemented and they're not properly documented, but I guess this will be fixed in the future. Um, uh, Elixir works in Ling. I ported React Core and React Pipe to 1.4 to Ling. It works, but it doesn't, well, it works on only one node because there's no net kernel and React needs net kernel. Uh, eJabberD works, N2O, the web framework works. And Link um, is a, li a part of Link and OpenFlow switch is in progress. And it's actually making it a lot faster. We use, we have a lot of stuff that makes Link basically work uh, as a platform, platform like solution. Um, if you missing features, you can always use OpenMirage, uh, have 9P servers, uh, b build them on your Linux machines, use rump, rump kernels, which are basically rewrapped NetBSD. Um, but it's not always Erlang and Zen, because you always have to run all your other applications, you have to prototype, and you have to actually fix someone's problems that you for people that use Linux. And I was trying to do that in a way that's currently popular, that allows you to embrace isolation, lightweight isolation on Linux system called containers. And in Linux, there's LXC and, and hipster Docker. There is NixOS, which is used by Haskell hackers. NixOS is actually pretty cool. It allows you to do functional like deployments um, on regular Linux systems without containers. Um, and there are solar zones and FreeBSD jails. Well, jails are pretty much broken anyway. So containers allow you to separate code from your data, allow you to have a single image deployment like you have in Erlang and Zen. You just build a single binary or just a single file system image and just transfer it to a machine and run it. If you need 10, you just have an API that allows you to spawn some more instances that look a lot like yours and configure them from your code. And you have sep and you can separate com code from your data as you don't have a regular file system and you just st store your data in non stored like React or React CS. And you don't have any configuration because extra configuration files because it's all defined with your application. It's very you need it very much when you have to deploy like CDN instances or on demand stream video streaming stuff. So I tried it's easier to have functional like deployments where there's immutable code and you replace it with other immutable code instances. Um, it's a lot easier to delete everything and then create it from scratch. And it means that you're prepared for failures. I call it Lambda Ops. Basically, you have single image deploys, uh, your app defines your resources. Uh, it's a lot easier to d spawn in other instances of, of the image and have like a copy update switch uh, and rollback if necessary. Your code is always your configuration. And to do that, we have a lot of tools like our own GUR a, um, build machine. It's pretty dumb. Some of the code is already available on our GitHub. There's no proper documentation yet because it's always working progress in progress, I think, after I finish with some work with making SSL work and then I'll publish something on GitHub. Um, we've been working on tools like Active, like having, um, it's like sync, but it doesn't actually hold your CPU all the time, so you can safely develop on your MacBooks while you're traveling. 
bindings for Docker, a proper fl flame graph profiler for Erlang, because, well, fprof is ugly, you know it. And uh, there are w web libraries like AVS, like a wrapper to React and Nija. By the way, Nija works in Ling. Uh, RabbitMQ clients, N2O, and much more. So stay tuned. It's still work in progress, but I think there be, will be more code soon and functionalize all the things. This is time for questions, right? Fire. Yes. Why do you say that FreeBSD jails are broken? Well, I guess they're not broken per se, but um, the community is not too much around jails. And it's not very easy how to replicate some features of zones like isolation of file system access and having sparse um, z sparse zones like you can like your OS can share some parts of the file systems. So that's why I think it's still broken and needs some work. But I guess there's I know that there's work to make um, pr private uh, networking stacks for FreeBSD and think about well, that's done. Like, zones will get more trails will get more traction. Yeah, there were some modifications. I think they are open source now. I'm not sure it was done by Maxim, who's the developer of Ling itself. If we don't have any more questions, then let's thank our speaker again. Yeah, thanks a lot and stay tuned. <laughs>